All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to the online global inference seminar. Today, we have a talk by Ingemar Berenbaum from Uppsala University on selection bias and multiple inclusion criteria and observational studies. The Q&A will actually be monitored by Stina Setterstrom, also from Uppsala, who will uh, be able to answer a lot of your questions, so please uh, write them in. And after the talk, our discussion today will be Maya Mather from Stanford University. So I hope you all uh, enjoyed today's talk. I will now switch it over to Georgia, who will explain the particularities of our Q&A section. Uh, thank you, Emma. Um, I'm very excited for the talk today. If you have questions during the talk, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to ask, and hopefully Stina will answer them live for you. And if uh, a question is important and Stina would like would like it to be answered live, then she can flag it for us and we can ask it directly to the speaker. Um, right, so uh, we're ready for you now. Share. So now please share your talk. So. Uh, that looks great. Thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity. I'm very excited. I've enjoyed these seminars and I'm very grateful that you're organizing them. So thank you from, from me and I'm sure they are very much appreciated in the causal community, these seminars. So this talk today is about selection bias and the inclusion exclusion criteria when we're defining a study population. And the results that I'm going to talk about are addressing sensitivity analysis of selection bias. But first, I would like to start with sort of putting this into um, context. So along with unmeasured confounding, selection bias is a threat to valid inference for causal estimates. And both the unmeasured confounding and selection bias have been a topic that has been of interest in the causal inference literature. But recently there's been a, a, lots of results for selection bias. So it's coming a little bit later than confounding. And maybe this, uh, the reason for this is something that we can discuss afterwards in the discussion, why the selection bias is, and all these results are sort of emerging now. And I have some thoughts, and I'm sure you all have that as well. So um, one reason might be this uh, quote that was stated by uh, Lou and co-authors. This is from uh, last year in the journal called Epidemiology. Selection bias remains a subject of controversy. Existing definitions of selection bias are ambiguous. And they continue with uh, a proposal to categorize selection bias into two types, type one selection bias and type two selection bias, where type one is sort of bias that uh, when considering inference for causal estimates in the study population and type two selection bias is when you're considering estimates that are describing the total population. And so they also want to sort of emphasize that uh, for type one bias, it's collider uh, conditioning on the colliders that are causing the type one errors, uh, selection bias and conditioning on effect modifiers is for type two errors. So the, uh, that's, that are suggestions from them in this review. But also there's a lot of results concerning selection bias in another area that is uh, concerning the merge of different data sources, for example, combining randomized controlled trials and observational studies. And here, this is sort of referred to a topic, the topics are called generalizability and transportability. And uh, last year, there was also a review by Dektiar and Rose in this topic and uh, sort of very in focus on what we're talking about today. So, uh, and here, generalizability is, uh, uh, when you're considering generalizing 
into the study population and where your data at hand is a subset of the study of the target population that you're interested in and transportability are addressing these situations when your data at hand is has uh, is not overlapping with the target population so that's sort of transporting results to another population so that also here there's uh, some difference in uh, terminology and then we have the structural causal models and that uh, frame that theoretical framework with the graphs and here we had a bulk of results uh, by uh, Baron Boym and Pearl and other co-authors uh, describing uh, selection diagrams and selection backdoor criteria sort of corresponding to the causal models we directed the cyclic graphs and the de-separation criteria so but uh, so th these are also fairly recent contributions and then uh, Van der Veel and different co-authors have uh, addressed sensitivity analysis, both for unmeasured confounding and selection bias. For example, the E-value, but also the work that we are building on is mainly the work with Smith and Van der Veel. And this is from epidemiology in 2019, where they propose bounds for uh, selection bias. And uh, the terminology that Smith and Vanderveel are using and that we are adopting as well is that instead of talking about the target population, we talk about the total population. And instead of talking about the study population, we talk about the subpopulation of the selected units. <clears throat> and we have, uh, we're concerning both total population estimates and subpopulation estimates that we're defining later. So this uh, uh, work that I'm presenting now is from two papers uh, and uh, my co-author is Tina Setterström that is also present here and uh, they build on this uh, sensitivity analysis where we're bounding the selection bias and we use the general assumptions that Smith and Van der Veel uh, did for their bound and they actually they don't specify any structural causal models or graphs they are just defined in the potential outcome framework and using an unobserved variable or a vector of unobserved variables so the framework is very general and uh, we started working with that and from applications we know that uh, Selecting a study population is often done on a sort of sequence or series of uh, inclusion or exclusion criteria. And that was, uh, it becomes quickly quite complicated. And we thought that maybe we could try to fill in some gap here from Smith and Vanderveel, even though they cover this general case, it's not that easy to sort of see how multiple inclusion and exclusion criteria affect the bounds and how you should implement them with this uh, inclusion criteria. So this, uh, as I said, the assumptions by Smith and Van der Veel, they are very general and they uh, just um, use the potential outcome framework but they include what we call a generalized M structure just to sort of um, help practitioners on for which kind of data situations can you use these bounds. But they also hold for smaller structures. For example, there was a very recent paper again in epidemiology by Schellander where, uh, called um, outcome dependent sampling, selection bias for outcome dependent sampling. So this is not um, like in any colliders, but only sort of outcome dependent sampling. And here, the assumptions of Smith and Van der Veel also holds for some of these um, settings that Schellander describes. So what we do is then we apply these multi-selection bounds and we also propose an assumption-free bound 
assuming, not assuming uh, any unobserved variables or any of these uh, conditional independent structures that uh, we're showing now. And then we apply it on a, a previous study from a epidemiological application for type 1 diabetes mellitus. So the generalized M structure it looks like this. So it's, it's our traditional M, but also including a direct effect from the treatment to the selection variable. And uh, Smith and Vanderville, they only have these two uh, uh, conditional independence assumptions. They distinguish them when the target estimates are these uh, total population parameters, then we assume that the outcome is independent of the selection variable conditional on the un unobserved variable and the treatment variable. And for the selected subpopulation parameters, it's sort of this similar to no one measured confounding. So for the potential outcome and the treatment, they are independent for the selected units under the conditioning on selection and this unobserved vector again. So, uh, and what we saw uh, quite uh, uh, at once when we worked with this was that specifying the sensitivity parameters that Smith and Vanderveel proposed is very difficult, especially in the multi selection case. So uh, we developed this R package called selection bias. And there we have this uh, simulated data set that is also inspired from an, a numerical example that Smith and Vanderbilt had for one selection. And we extended it with <clears throat> one more selection. And then we also uh, have shown some additional properties of the SV bounds that uh, were not um, in this um, first papers by Smith and Van der Veel. So what are feasible values of the sensitivity parameters was one of our questions. And when the, are the bounds sharp? So this um, we show in uh, one of the two papers that we uh, have written. And this is inspired very much from a paper by Schellander where he showed this variation independence and sharpness of bounds for the E value, so for um, unmeasured compounding. So when we select the study population, uh, we make uh, restrictions for who is going to be included in, in the population or in the, in the study that we're conducting. So this is from the last uh, issue of British Medical Journal. And this is a Swedish register study. Uh, so usually this kind of uh, selection restrictions are just uh, described in the text in a section called maybe data and study population or something similar. So here is uh, the authors are describing their study using this registry. They write, we identified 2 million women who had the first delivery during 1973 to 2015. To improve internal comparability, only singleton deliveries were included in the analysis, given the higher prevalence of adverse pregnancy outcomes and different underlying causes in multiple gestation, gestation pregnancies. And they continue to describe what they exclude as well. So I have done similar descriptions like this in several applied papers. So this is whatever journal we, you look in, this is something that you will see. And this is actually sort of exactly describing the selection process. And usually you see it in the text or you see it in a figure called a flow chart that sort of depicts uh, where you start with the total population and where you exclude uh, cases, individuals or patients along the way. 
and where you end up with a study population. So as I go along, I'm going to use this Zika example that we have in our Zika learner from the package. And that's sort of there to, to learn the functions in the package for everyone. And yeah, so I'm using that to demonstrate um, the issues of selection bias. So in Smith and Vanderbilt, they had this Zika example where uh, uh, Zika infection uh, is uh, affecting whether you have a live or stillbirth or you have a terminated pregnancy in form of a miscarriage, for example. And then also socioeconomic status is affecting that and also uh, has an effect on the outcome that's microcephaly. That's a sort of known um, uh, the consequence or uh, there's a causal effect of Zika on microcephaly. So, and how much these selections, this selection is affecting the estimate of uh, the effect of Zika on microcephaly is a question. And then uh, inspired also by applied studies on Zika and microcephaly, we have included a second selection in our data set, whether or not you deliver your baby on, in a public hospital. And we think then we have this uh, uh, M structure here with the living area effects, whether you are sick infected, because there's uh, mosquitoes that are the cause of this um, infection and also affecting whether you deliver on a public hospital uh, and so on. And we've already seen some of the notation and usually uh, in this, all these papers describing these, at least in the EPI literature, you, we have uh, these very um, big assumptions that we don't consider sampling variability. We just look at the, uh, uh, observed estimates and uh, we don't consider confounding. We try to isolate confounding from selection bias and we consider all analysis within a stratum of X. We use T for treatment. We have U for unobserved variables and also we have a V for an unobserved variable in this M structure. And the X is the covariate. Um, the potential outcomes, and this is also an important restriction, they are binary. So, the, for instance, a disease, having a disease or not. And then uh, the difference also from Smith, Smith and Vanderbilt is that we introduce this selection indicator. We allow for this K selection variables and uh, then we have the selection indicator that takes the value one if the, all the uh, selection variables are equal to one. So as soon as you don't fulfill one of the criteria, you're not in the study. So this is sort of reflecting the uh, practice. Okay, we have four causal estimates, uh, two uh, causal risk ratios, one in the total population and one in the selected subpopulations. And then we also consider the risk difference. So the risk difference in the, in the total population and the risk difference in the selected subpopulation. And in our Zika learner, we have generated all the data so we know the true causal estimates. And then we define uh, observed data estimates. Uh, they are just the observed outcome conditional on the treatment that was actually taken and the selection indicator. So this is something that you would be able to estimate in your data, both this observed uh, ratio and also this observed difference. Uh, and how we think about uh, 
is ignoring sampling variability is just that if we have a mean outcome among treatment group T that were selected, that would converge to this observed data estimate. So we see that as an uh, approximation of this asymptotic uh, limit. And in the C learner, we have in our data set that consists of 5,000 individuals, we have this uh, observed data estimates as well. So, uh, by these two, we define the bias. So the bias for the causal risk ratio is this observed data estimate divided by the true causal risk ratio. So, and the bias for the uh, risk difference is then defined as the difference between this observed data estimate and the causal risk difference. And so, since we have all both the true causal estimates in the data learner and also this observed data estimates, we can we know what the bias is in the SQL learner. And uh, usually, in a data situation, we don't know the true causal estimates, but from the data we have this um, observed data estimates. And similar, uh, we can uh, define the bias for the subpopulation estimates. And these observed data estimates, they are the same. They are the ones we have. We, uh, and, uh, but in the denominator, we have this uh, causal estimate in the subpopulations. So we define it the same way here with the ratio and the risk difference. And also, again, we have that for the seeker learner. So what um, uh, the Smith and Van der Veel bounce says that, OK, we have this value and we know that we can calculate this value and we know that it's going to be larger than the bias. And we're going to use some sensitivity parameters to calculate this bound. And when we have done that, we have a number here. And we have a number here, and then we sort of solve for the true causal estimate. So we can conclude that the true causal estimate is at least the ratio between this observed data estimate and the bound. So, and similarly for the causal risk difference. So that's the idea with the Smith and Van der Veel bound. And then they have these different sensitivity parameters, and they are different for the different uh, causal estimates, but they describe aspects of the conditional uh, distribution of the outcome, conditional on the treatment, and this observed U. So we have to think about this U, what it can be, and also uh, the distribution of U conditional on the treatment and the selection indicator. So here we have an explanation for what, what they are, these sensitivity parameters. And for the case of one selection, you can sort of reason around this and think about this maximum relative risk for the outcome when we compare two values of U, for example, for the treated and for the controls, and so on. And then these sensitivity parameters, uh, they are constructed uh, according to this into two bounding factors. And then the bound for the uh, causal risk ratio is the product of these two bounding factors. And a similar bound is done for the subpopulation, but with a different bounding factor. And also for the risk difference, we have similar bounds. So when we extend the framework and started to um, use these bounds with multiple selections, we saw that it's uh, uh, they can of, they can be both larger and smaller when you include more selections. And we just studied the partial derivatives of uh, these uh, bounds with respect to the selection indicator. So that's we saw that they could be smaller or larger. And, uh, but, uh, so that's sort of quite strict, 
for what you can think about that, that one, you get one selection bias and the next will sort of either add or cancel the direction of the first one. So uh, that was not uh, too surprising, but importantly, we thought that it can be too difficult for the researcher to provide these plausible values for the sensitivity parameters. So we made this numerical solution in this R package. And here we, you can put in the, your uh, V, your U, and then different models for the treatment and the outcome and the selection indicator. Uh, so you can, we have two options. We did a logistic regression models or probit models where you, you sort of specify these uh, dependencies in the M structure. So you can sort of predict the uh, birth from Zika. So you can think about, for example, odds ratios, what, what they would be like for one, for, for this one and also for this one and so on. So, uh, and then your output is uh, the sensitivity, the bounding factor, and also the individual sensitivity parameters. Uh, so in the Zika virus example, so, oh, I forgot the very important thing is that uh, uh, when you uh, calculate these bounds, you have to know the direction of the bi bias because we're only bounding the bias from above. So we assume that uh, there's a positive bias, but that, that's also hard to sort of assume when you do these multiple selections. So that's also in the package that whether or not your assumed structure that you use for the parameters, uh, sensitivity parameters leads to uh, thinking that the bias is overestimated or underestimated. And if it's actually uh, underestimated, the, you, will, uh, you can easily remedy that by recoding the treatment into the other direction, and then you still get the upper bound for the bias. So this is also included in the package when you uh, enter your M assumptions in your M structure. Is it okay if I interrupt you for a couple of questions? Of course. Um, so Ching Ron has a, a question. Do you want to answer it, to ask it directly? All right. Anyways, I can, I can read it. He wrote it. Uh, in the graph that you had for your Zika example, uh, you um, don't have an arrow from birth into microencephaly. Um, so Jingyuan is asking whether um, this makes sense because there seems to be that in order for uh, in order for a baby to have a condition on the baby's head, it only makes sense to condition on having given birth. Yes, but in the this example, still births are included, so you can have birth and the babies not alive, but it, um, miscarriages are not. Uh, um, that's a selection variable, but but um, I mean reasoning around this uh, in Smith uh, in Smith and Van der Veel, they uh, decided to that birth was not a direct effect on microcephaly. So I I guess you you don't get microcephaly from whether you are born or not you have you have that has been decided earlier so in that sense i think that this is a reasonable assumption so it's affecting ck is affecting birth but birth is not affecting microcephaly it's not a cause of microcephaly thank you okay <laughs> yeah and Stina answered the other question in the chat so great Okay, thanks. Yes, so we use this machinery and then we can make this conclusion about that 
about the true cost estimates or, or the sensitivity analysis will give us a statement saying that, okay, the true cost relative risk in the subpopulation, which was the uh, estimate that we considered here in this example, is at least, uh, and then a number that comes from this bound. And here we have recorded, the, the treatment was recorded, so that's why we have this small number here. Okay, so uh, also we propose this assumption-free bound, very simplistic bound <laughs> that inspired, was inspired actually from uh, Schellander's paper on bounds for the E-value. But of course, uh, ones that have been around for a long time know Mansky and there's so many bounds out there. So, and we try to cite others, but we don't think that this bound has actually been proposed before. But yeah, we will see. Uh, time, will, time will tell, but we think that's, that this is new, a new contribution. So what we do is that we consider the smallest value that this uh, causal risk ratio can, can take, the smallest possible value. And we just do that by decomposing it in the usual way of uh, the factual and counterfactual, but it will also, of course, now include the selection variable because that's part of being able to observe something is also that it's selected. And then uh, we make this uh, uh, statement on, on what is the smallest possible, what is the smallest possible value of uh, the causal risk ratio. And we plug that in into uh, the assumption free bound. So we have the observed data estimate, we have the smallest possible value. So that means that when we uh, solve for this uh, beta from this bound here, then we know that the true beta is at least this uh, uh, value that we obtain from the data. And this value we only obtain from the data. So we don't, we haven't assumed anything about you and so on. It's just by the uh, construction that it cannot be larger than this bound, it's numerically impossible. And that's also something that we saw when we worked with the Smith and Vanderbilt bound, that uh, sometimes the risk difference, for example, was larger than two, and we know that numerically not possible. So that's just infeasible. So we knew that there should be some way to bound uh, to get a tighter, to, to get rid of those situations. So, and we made similar bounds for the other parameters as well. And this is also included in the uh, R package. Uh, so, uh, here for the same example that I showed uh, previously with the Smith and Vanderbilt bound was two point something. I don't remember now, what was it? 1.56, we see that this is 3.5 in the same example. So we, then we get the statement uh, from this bound as well, without assuming anything about uh, the unobserved variables. But this assumption-free bound provides some important thing that we know that it's, uh, it's the smallest bound that's logically possible. Uh, so that if the Smith and Van der Veel bound is larger than this uh, assumption free bound, it's just not uh, sharp because the bias cannot take the value, cannot uh, be that value. So, uh, we can use this to assess whether or not the Smith and Vanderbilt bound is sharp. So we know that uh, uh, there's in this region uh, above the AF bound, the Smith and Vanderbilt or no bound is sharp. And here we have an inconclusive region 
And then there's a sharp limit for the Smith and Mandelville bound that we have been searching for. And uh, so we uh, have derived such results for the subpopulation S demands. We will see just soon. And why is this important? Yes, because if the bound is not sharp, we know beforehand that it's too pessimistic. It's not um, useful. So um, what do we search for when we search for a sharp bound? Well, we search for a criteria that we can check with the data. So. So it's, we, we want to check something, we want to know something that we can use the data to help us assess. So we can calculate the, uh, the Smith and Van der Wiele bound and we can check with our criteria if it's sharp uh, and if it's sharp, if it's not, then we know that it's overly pessimistic. So we can check that with the data. But first, before we do that, we have to think about the sensitivity parameters. So what uh, in order to, uh, because it might be the case that we assume things with the sensitivity parameters such that the bound cannot be sharp. So we know, want to know that we can consider values of the sensitivity parameters freely without um, assuming some values for one sensitivity parameter and then that implies that some other sensitivity parameters has to be below some value and so on. Uh, so th that we did in uh, a theorem and we saw that they are what we call variation independent. So they have to be equal to or above one. They can't be smaller than one. And they are not restricted by each other. So since if we just consider values above one, then we can consider whatever values we find plausible. So that's the first uh, sort of green light towards the bound. Uh, and then we uh, derive the condition for uh, the sharpness of the bound in the subpopulation. So if we have the true sensitivity parameters, uh, then if uh, this was uh, the bounding factor for the uh, subpopulation parameters, if that is below this uh, one over this observed probability, and this we have in the data, so we can check this assumption, we come up with this sensitivity parameters that we have guessed, and we can check if it's smaller than this criterion. So this is a sufficient condition for sharpness of the uh, bound, bounds in the subpopulation. So that was one of our results. And then we saw that there are no corresponding results for sharp bounds in the total population. And we write about why and have some reasoning around that. So that's up for if there's someone interested in seeing if what kind of conditions uh, are there for a sharp bound for the total population. Nothing simple like this uh, or nothing uh, that we could find but but so that's uh, and there is reason as as we write about why it, you can't find that. Okay, and here I have just um, written about the functions in this package. So I will leave that, I think, and conclude instead because I'm uh, getting close to 40 minutes here. So I want to wrap up. So uh, study population inclusion and exclusion criteria, they can result in selection bias. And uh, we can make sensitivity analysis for selection bias under these general assumptions that Smith and Van der Wiel proposed. And just not assuming any graphs, but uh, just some potential outcome um, assumptions. And um, yeah, 
for the total population as demands and subpopulation as demands. And they include this generalized M structure. And we extended this framework to multiple selections and wrote a little about that. And then we also made some results on variation independence for the sensitivity parameters and conditions for sharp bounds. And we proposed uh, this assumption free bound and we made this our package. And we applied these results in, a tuto in this uh, tutorial data set, Zika Learner, and also in a previous study of the effect of preterm birth of type 1 diabetes mellitus. So, okay, thank you. And over to you. Uh, who is the moderator? Maybe Ying. Yeah, thanks. Thank or you, Emma. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yes, like I can take over. So we don't have uh, actually questions at the moment. I would encourage all the audience to submit questions now, but then we will move on to the discussion by Maya, and I'm sure that will raise some questions as well. So Maya, whenever you're ready. Yeah, I think I need permission to screen share. Please. Ah, there we go. Okay, great. So um, thank you, Ingborg. That was a really interesting talk. And um, I was so excited to read your paper because it feels like such a, a, a pressing problem with respect to selection bias. So um, I'll call them ZW. So just to summarize, they propose some interesting bounds for selection bias that obviate any assumptions on the causal structure and that also have this nice property of uh, naturally accommodating multiple selection indicators. And what I want to do in my portion is further discuss the role of these bounds, as well as Smith and Vanderweel, their assumptions and their resulting precision. So let's start with the Smith and Vanderweel bound. So as Ingborg said, this is based on the E value for uncontrolled confounding. And so in a sense that I'll describe later, this means that essentially these independence assumptions they have are um, to the end of ensuring that the way selection bias manifests graphically is um, equivalent in some sense to confounding. We'll, we'll see what I mean later. And so sort of four key properties of this approach are firstly, these two independence assumptions that Engborg mentioned, uh, which I'll come back to. Uh, a second thing I want to highlight is that this bound treats the probability of selection, PS equals one, as unknown. So it doesn't assume that we have any knowledge about that. Um, it, it considers a single selection indicator S, and it specifies or alternatively solves for the severity of selection bias based on uh, certain sensitivity parameters, which essentially, if we're bounding the effect in the total population, essentially have to do with how strongly associated um, some set of unmeasured variables are with Y and also with S, conditional on treatment. And going forward, I'm going to speak primarily about bounds on the total population um, just for simplicity. So in contrast, the ZW bound is interesting in that it's sort of a Mansky-like approach, right? So it uses empirical estimates from the data and probability constraints that hold regardless of the causal structure. And so we have a couple differences from the Smith and Vanderweel approach. First, the ZW bound, um, only, the only real sort of structural assumption it makes is kind of regular no unmeasured confounding. So just that the potential outcome yt is independent of t. Um, it assumes that the selection probability ps equals one is known. And so that's used in, uh, in creating these, these probabilistic constraints. Um, it does naturally accommodate a composite selection variable. And again, it doesn't, it doesn't require sensitivity parameters um, about the severity of selection bias. So let's zoom in on kind of one key difference, which is the structural assumptions in Smith and Vanderweel. So I'm going to break this down and talk about what this actually means graphically. So their first assumption is that uh, y of t is independent of t given s equals 1 and u. And so basically what this is saying is um, if there are any non-causal paths between t and y, 
that are unblocked conditional on S. There exists some set of variables U in the DAG that would suffice to block those non-causal paths if they were measured. We're going to see some graphical examples, but essentially, you know, these paths between T and Y could manifest as backdoor paths. They could manifest as M bias paths. They're essentially paths that are open conditional on S, um, basically because S has some collider relationship to that path. Second assumption is that Y is independent of S given both T and U. And so um, this, is, this is basically saying that jointly T and U um, would actually suffice to block all paths between Y and S, not just backdoor, could be directed paths, um, could be unbiased paths, whatever. And this is essentially um, preventing sort of effect heterogeneity by S. Um, one piece of intuition that can be helpful for the second one is uh, say we're considering selection bias due to conducting a complete case analysis in the presence of missing data. So in that case, uh, if Y is the only missing variable, then the second assumption basically amounts to missingness at random, um, if U had been a measured variable. Uh, a paper that Engborn mentioned that I highly recommend uh, if you want to learn more about Mar from a graphical point of view is Mohan and Pearl. Great, great work. Okay, so let's look at some examples. So in these first two examples, these are cases where we can apply the Smith and Vanderweel bound. So in each of these cases, there is a, if we condition only on S, there is a non-causal path between T and Y because S is a collider. But also in each of these cases, if I were to condition V, then that would not only block this non-causal path between T and Y, but it would also deseparate Y from S. And so interestingly, in the second example, um, you might say, well, what if I choose W instead? That would at least block the non-causal path between T and Y. Well, that won't work because W does not deseparate Y from S. Okay, so the second assumption wouldn't hold in this case. And so in both of these DAGs, essentially the, the U that we're referring to is V itself. Down below are two cases where Smith and Vanderwill does not apply. So here we just have a directed path from Y to S. And so the second assumption can't be met. There's no U that would suffice to deseparate them. In the second example, we have a variable V that's a collider on this non-causal TY path, uh, but conditioning it doesn't work because we still have this non-causal path even if we condition T. Okay, so that's just to give a sense of kind of what are the structures where uh, we can use the sensitivity analysis versus where we can't. Um, just a brief aside, we might also ask kind of, are there general rules for when a conditioning set would suffice to eliminate selection bias? The answer is yes. Um, if the causal structure is fully known, um, there are these two uh, key papers, Baron Boyam and Tian and Mohan and Pearl that, that give us rules. Uh, more recently, if the causal structure is not fully known, um, some work that I was involved with gives some uh, criteria similar to a common cause principle for confounding. Okay, but anyway, so back to the ZW bound, I was especially excited to see what this would tell us in a structure where we know that Smith and Vanderwill doesn't apply. So I looked at just a simple setting. Uh, this is one of the DAGs you saw earlier where uh, we just have that selection is a direct descendant of the outcome Y. So we know we can't apply Smith and Vanderwill. What would we get from the ZW bound? So again, I focused on the bounding the total population ATE, in this case, the risk ratio. And so I just did a very simple test example where uh, T is, is just randomly assigned with a probability of 0.5. Um, and I manipulated the selection probability. So it ranged from uh, about 0.2 to close to 0.9. And in this example, the true risk ratio in the target population was 1.5. And so, um, so what we see is that you know this this bound is um, is fairly imprecise with a selection probability of 0.2. It starts at a risk ratio of 0.1 again compared to a true value is 1.5, so far on the other direction of the null. 
Um, and then as the selection probability increases, certainly the bound does become more precise as we would hope. Um, although in this particular case, it never exceeded a risk ratio of 0.4. But again, certainly better a relatively imprecise bound than no bound. This is a structure where we can't apply Smith and van der Waal. And so uh, we do also see something uh, perhaps even more extreme with the Zika example, where um, even though the selection probability is 0.8 and the observed risk ratio is 65, so an enormous um, causative effect, the bound is actually a risk ratio of 0.01. So we know without any information that it has to be greater than zero, right? So it's a pretty, it's a pretty wide bound. So I was curious, what would the circumstances be where the bound is actually greater than the null? Um, and so I looked just at the lower bound on beta R, the risk ratio, and I thought, okay, let me let me consider a case that's kind of seems favorable to getting a maximally informative bound. So let's consider the case where the selection probability is actually one. So we've actually, everyone in the target population is actually selected. Um, and I won't go through the, the steps here, but it turned out that um, even in that, what I think is a favorable case, the bound still always has to be less than one. Um, and so that made me wonder whether there were other contexts where we can get a bound exceeding the null. Uh, maybe that happens when we bound the effect in a selected population or something like that. So I'd be curious to know what the conditions are for that to hold. Um, okay, so second point of difference I wanted to mention is the role of the selection probability in these two respective bounds. So uh, the ZW bound uses uh, information about PS equals one, uh, treating it as known, which potentially allows a sharper bound than Smith and van der Waal. And I think this is a great advance because there are many contexts in which we do know uh, the selection probability. So if we do a complete case analysis, we know. If we have attrition in a longitudinal study, we know. Um, I do think there are also contexts where we may not know the selection probability. Um, and so I was curious what would happen uh, with the ZW bound if we actually did treat the selection probability as unknown, which I think would probably amount to conservatively setting it to zero. And I was curious if we would get, get any bound um, and how that would compare to Smith and van der Waal. Um, I'll just briefly say sort of one hybrid approach uh, between um, having E-value type sensitivity parameters, but also assuming P S equals one is known is something I worked on recently, called it the M value. Um, and it's certainly not a panacea, it has its own limitations, but it does apply for this hybrid case where we know P S equals one. Um, and it also accommodates possibilities where perhaps we think that the ATE and the unobserved S equals zero group uh, can't be on the wrong side of the null, um, even though we don't observe anything else about it. And so in that case, this approach can also uh, subsume certain worst case imputation methods. Um, I think I'm relatively running out of time, so I won't talk more about this. Um, again, it, it certainly has limitations. It still has one of the two structural assumptions that Smith and van der Waal have, and it only works for risk differences. So just in closing, the, the two main questions I had were, firstly, whether there are contexts where the bound can exceed the null, um, and also what might happen if we treated the selection probability as unknown. And third sort of bonus question is, uh, so you know, if we're in a small sample setting and we don't necessarily have um, asymptotics such that the sample estimates are really close to the truth, then um, have you explored kind of inference on the bound itself to try to see how, how close that might be? Um, and my slide decks are posted online, so if you want the list of references, you can download that. Thank you. Thanks, Maya. Uh, thanks for the discussion. So uh, we'll give the speaker a chance to respond, and I think we have another question from one of our panelists. And thank you, Stina, for answering all the questions in the Q&A. So thank you for this discussion, Maya. So that was really, really nice. Uh, I'm not sure I have a good answer, but I feel very, I feel the urge to sit with the pen and look at the calculations. Uh, we know that the, the bound doesn't work well also when the probability of the outcome is small. So 
for our uh, example with type 1 diabetes mellitus, the bound is huge. So we know that it's, it's just not informative in many cases there. But um, yeah, so yeah, we have to think more on, on this. Uh, I'm not sure, it's, maybe Stina wants to, did you get some immediate reaction? Um, uh, no, not uh, not an immediate reaction. Uh, I I was answering questions in the in the chat. Okay. So I was also aware very recently about this paper with uh, where you look at, where uh, Maya and the co-authors look at uh, sufficient uh, sets of confounders to remedy selection bias so that's also of interest and this also relates to this um, view in the Smith and Vanderville because we know if we would think about you as something observed we know that it's it's a, a set of confounders that is closest to the outcome and that's sort of the often the best set that we can use for uh, efficiency reasons. And we also know from previous results that that is a sufficient subset for to adjust for confounding. But uh, it wouldn't be a U if it, it was there, so it doesn't help us. <laughs> uh, sometimes we can think about something unobserved that is really close to the outcome so in the, all those cases i think that is very helpful these assumptions for the smith and vanderville and uh, i think our bound in those cases don't have a chance <laughs> really uh, in um, uh, being a complement because this information is just too valuable but yeah I, I didn't manage to see the questions online so I don't remember more but I think this um, uh, having the selection probability is also quite uh, uh, a plausible assumption for example in these register studies when we are sort of excluding cases the whole time we know exactly how many cases we're excluding so that's uh, yeah, something that seems reasonable yeah totally i think one thing that's really cool about your incorporation of the selection probability is that I, I tried to force it into the to the Smith and Vanderbilt bound on the risk ratio scale and just couldn't do it. So that's why when I incorporated it, it was only on the risk difference scale. So yours is really the only game in town if you want to do a bound on the risk ratio scale and you have PS equals one, you can't do an E value thing, as far as I know. <laughs> Thanks. Um, can you, did this answer your question or would you still like to follow up? Uh, yes, if, if I can. Um... Um, so this is, um, I guess, not, not really a criticism, but, but also I got these questions when I used to work on Rosenbaum type sensitivity analysis. So the question is, I guess, for both, um, both of you, is sharpness of these bounds and other bounds enough? Uh, because I, I'm asking this because the worst case scenario for, for these bounds often require that the unmeasured variable u has a very specific distribution. And sometimes I, 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 I find those distributions uh, quite unrealistic. Do you think the bounds are too conservative for practical usage, even though they are quote unquote sharp? Uh, should I reply? I, well, I don't think, I don't think they are useless for practical use. On the contrary, I think they are very useful. And I think that uh, all kind of sensitivity analysis, both for our national confounding and selection bias should be applied a lot more than we are actually doing in applications. So I really encourage um, this kind of sensitivity analysis. And the sharpness of the bounds enough <laughs> Uh, I don't know what, what I should say about that. Uh, 
Yeah, it's a strange, maybe. I mean, that's just that it's po possible that the bias can take the value of the bound, that the bias can be equal to the bound, but that can be for an extreme case, uh, as I think you that was what you sort of thought about that for some specific distributions and so on. So that's that's not enough, I guess. But uh, I mean, I guess that we can also complement the assumptions as you saw that they are very general, these uh, conditional independence assumptions. And I think uh, if we could get more fill up with assumptions that can be checked with data. So that's the what we need. We want to use the data to help us. So yeah, that's a short reply from me. I mean, just thinking out loud here, but I mean, it'd be kind of interesting to look at sort of, you know, what are the conditions under which um, each of these two bounds are kind of as informative as possible? Then you mentioned like when P Y equals one is larger then that's helpful for, for your bound. I think from looking, I don't think it helps necessarily if like P T equals one is, is large or small, but um, yeah, I don't know. It could be interesting to like take some derivatives of these and see like, you know, when are they going to be most useful? So it definitely seems like there are cases where, um, you know, they're going to be in either case, they're going to be just not informative. They'll be too conservative. But, you know, I think like with the E value there, then will also be cases where um, they're, you know, sharp enough to be helpful. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you both. Uh, I think we'll then move to wrapping this up. Okay. Great. All right. Um, Wonderful. So uh, thank you again to Ingeborg and to Maya for their talk and discussion. And thank you, Tina, for answering all the questions in the Q&A. Uh, we will make sure to pass on all the questions to the speakers. So uh, if you've asked a question and you're wondering if it got to the speaker, it will uh, to, to all of them. Um, great. Next week, we'll have a talk by Christina Yu from Cornell University. So hope you all join us. Uh, for that talk and discussion. Thank you all.